After bearing witness to two insightful discussion, it is time for us to delve into the field of cinema through our next session, Other People, Other Places, exploring otherization in cinematic storytelling. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are all set to witness and to move into the world of cinema. And for that, let me take this opportunity to invite none other than Mr. Devashish Makija. Can we have a huge round of applause for Mr. Devashish Makija? Please do join me right here on the stage. He's a filmmaker who has written and directed award-winning short films, including Thandav, Cycle and others. He's an author of the best-selling children's book, like When Ali Became Bajrang Bali, Why Papalu Was Perplexed, and the Neve Literature Award-winning YA novel, Unga. And this session, he will introduce us to his cinematic storytelling as he shares few clips and discusses some of his works. Over to you, sir. Don't go by that bombastic introduction. I'm a very somber guy and I'm very anxious, so bear with me. I just request all of you to come forward because I'm going to play a few clips and I think all of this will get in the way of the image. The closer you are, the clearer it will be and the less anxious I'll be. So most of, the, most of the stories that I'm going to talk to you about today, some of them are children's books, some of them were in a collection of short stories and one was a novel called Unga, which was a film first and as it often happens in the film industry, stories around the marginalized, the tribal especially, don't make it to the mainstream. So this was a film I made 10 years back that never released, uh, it's not in any online space, no one ever saw it. So I converted it into a novel, I took eight years to write it into a novel that won the Neve Literature Award two years ago. So uh, what I want to talk about really today is A, the fact that uh, in the mainstream there are voices that are not represented and I am a privileged non-tribal who is telling stories of the tribal. So I am not blind to the fact that I'm constantly appropriating and I'm constantly otherizing. So this is something that I want to speak about by sharing with you glimpses of my work and it's taken me 10 to 12 years to really arrive at this this dichotomy, this understanding of this inner conflict, this paradox that I cannot help but tell these stories because someone needs to, someone needs to bridge this gap which is almost unbridged after what, 75 years of independence. But I am not a tribal, so I'm getting a lot of things wrong. So I'm going to start with showing a little uh, trailer of my book, Unga, which uses clips from the film. So, you know, it's quite evident that uh, the privileged lens to the community that I'll speak for myself, I don't belong to, often, often sort of prioritizes and sort of front and centers the narrative of violence. And over the last 10, 12 years of telling these stories, I have not been able to, I have tried, I have traveled tribal areas, I've lived with tribals, I've been a tribal activist, I've had very difficult protracted conversations with tribal groups, especially after this book released. And I was constantly questioned about this lens of how we only see that one small part of tribal life which is 
the, the, the violence being perpetrated on them and the counter violence that sort of succeeds it. And although the story was written 12, 13 years ago, I'm still to sort of uh, wean that out of my system. But because it's something that, uh, I mean, outside of that, what a tribal, uh, a tribal's world and, it's, and a tribal's inextricable, uh, you know, existence with the jungle, with the forest, is something that people in the city, most people in the city, I, I won't speak for the sensitive people in this room, but there are enough people outside of this lot that don't really consider or think that's important enough to be part of a discourse. Because when we are, when we are living these unsustainable lives, like in this room, we're using electricity with, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in the canteen, there'll be water in plastic bottles. There's uh, steel and uh, iron ore and bauxite being used for mics, for speakers, for that camera. This unsustainable life comes at a cost and people in the city, most, most of them, don't want to think about that cost, don't want to talk about it, and definitely don't want to see it in their stories. Because stories to date are meant to entertain, and I try to not entertain as much as possible. So uh, again, 12, 13 years of telling these stories, and I, I started wondering why am I drawn to these stories? What is my story? Where do I fit into all of this? And the one thing that kept jumping out at me is that I uh, probably relate to the the rootlessness of the displaced. I am a Sindhi. I'm actually a first generation Indian in my family. Both my parents came from what is now known as Pakistan during the partition. My father was eight, my mother was six. And uh, we, uh, unlike a lot of other Sindhis who came to Bangalore or Bombay, where they were given uh, resources by the state when they moved uh, this side. And when I say Sindhis, I'm referring to the Hindu Sindhis the Muslims in the state back in Pakistan. But my family uh, went to Calcutta, I don't know why, and Calcutta really there was no system, the government didn't have a system to really uh, accommodate the Sindhi refugees who landed up there. So we ended up living, in, I grew up in, I was born and I grew up in a slum which was uh, predominantly occupied by Bangladeshi Muslim refugees who came this side during the Bangladesh war in 1971. And tracing my, uh, this inner conflict back I realized that it had its seeds in the night of the 6th of December 1992. On that night, uh, I don't know what happened, but uh, news from Ayodhya reached Bombay, reached Calcutta, and we were attacked. And we were attacked by people, by, by youngsters I had grown up with, youngsters I went to school with, youngsters I had learned to ride my bicycle with, youngsters I played cricket with, youngsters I went to karate class with. They all ganged up on us and they didn't know why either. The next morning, things were back to some sort of normal, but those questions remained. And I kept asking my parents for all the years till they both passed, that who decides who's an insider and who's an outsider? The person who came first becomes an insider relative to the person who came later. Does religion decide who's an insider and who's an outsider? I didn't get answers, so I kept bringing those questions into my stories. So I'll read one small scene from the film Unga that actually never released. Uh, I'm hoping all of you all here understand Hindi. Yes, but if you don't, you can ask me later, I'll translate. So in the, the story, as you saw, there's a little Adivasi boy who sort of uh, goes to the city because his, uh, he missed a school trip. His Adivasi teacher was, uh, took all the students to the city to show them the Ramayan, not for any other reason, but for them to, for, uh, to expose them to what the mainstream consists of. Because every time a company wants land, wants Adivasi land, and the Adivasi village refuses to give the land, they get labeled sympathizers, and the CRPF comes and there is some sort of war. So all the people from the company to the CRPF are actually not Adivasi and they don't speak that language of the village. So this teacher took it upon herself to ensure that there is dialogue and since the people from the city won't take the initiative to learn the Adivasi tongue, she thought she would teach the Adivasi Hindi or something of the mainstream so that there'd be some parity in conversation so that the Adivasi could fight for their rights. But the CRPF sends two Jawans to the city to find out what was this teacher doing in the city? Was she training the kids? Now of these two Jawans, one has been in the force for 20 years and he's fairly cynical 
and uh, doesn't really question his orders. He just wants his monthly paycheck. The other has just joined the system and he's just wrought with questions and he doesn't know why he's doing what he's doing. So the elder one's called Pradeep, the younger one's called Sushil. So they reach the city and the first thing Pradeep does is he goes to a dance bar because he said, I don't get to come to a city very often. We'll do our investigation tomorrow. I need a drink. He's pouring out his 10th drink and Sushil is looking at him a little shocked because he just wants to get on with the job. He's paranoid. Pradeep asks him, Tumre bapu ka karte hai? Sushil says, Sarkari naukari, sir. Pradeep says, Wah, re khush kismat. Hamre bapu kisan the. He empties his glass, fills it up again. Company aayi thi hamri jameen lene. Factory lagani thi unko. Jahan baaki kisano ne samete note, hamre bapu ne kiya inkar. Dimaag discount mein jo bech ke aayi thi. Company ke babu ko bole, Desh ka development to kar loge sahib, par hamara kya? So, one day, the police came. We told our father that there was a complaint in the house. Where is it, brother? When did the father come and say? Daroga cut. The officer of the father's knowledge is dangerous. The father is surprised. He said, what is it? Kanistabal took the father's hasiya. Hasiya is asking. Sushil says, we are cutting the hasiya. Pradeep says, that's it. The father of Daroga took the hasiya in the house and told the father of the Kanistabal, let's go. बापू हैरान बोले हमसे कहा गलती हुई कनिस्तबल बोला हथियार रखते हो पूछते हो कहा गलती हुई बोलो प्रदीप फिनिश इज नेक्स्ट क्लास पोर्स अनदर ड्रिंक सेस पैसे तो मिले नहीं साला जमीन से भी हाथ धो बैठे हम तब बारह बरस के नहीं थे देखा भाई वाह हट्टा कट्टा मरद बापू वर्दी को देखकर इतना डरे है हमारी आंखें तो गोल गोल हो गई ठान लिए कि जल्द से जल्द वर्दी में घुस जाएंगे खेती बाड़ी के चक्की में नहीं पिसना वैसे भी हमारी जमीन पर अब गाड़ियां जोगने वाली थी प्रदीप आस सुशील तुम काहे ज्वाइन किए फोर्स सुशील सेस नौकरी सर प्रदीप सेस वाह सुशील सही जवाब सुशील लुक्स कंसर्न ही सेस फिर आपके बापू का क्या हुआ प्रदीप सेस नौकरी अब उसी फैक्ट्री के वॉचमैन है हम भी वर्दी वो भी वर्दी I'll play another little a clip of a short film in which I'm guilty again of otherizing because I focused on the, the violence more than anything else. But it's just something that helps me initiate conversation because when I start talking to, like I said, city people about what else the Adivasi life entails, a lot of them, including, like I've, I'll come to the third clip later, there's a film of mine called Joram with Manoj Bajpayee who plays an Adivasi. And if the, the images that you see in this trailer, I kid you not, at least 80% of the people I show it to, they're like, do tribals dress like this even today? I'm like, just travel with me. I mean, you're sitting in the city, it's very easy to, to create that one narrative that the mainstream media would like you to believe. But there are at least 99 other narratives that won't reach you. अमर बुधू रात का ना बाड़ीर पथे या ना गुना आ आ अमर बुधू रात का ना बाड़ीर पथे या ना गुना पिंसायरे उठे धान कुटे हो कुटे है गोदोरे पीरी पीर फूल फूटे गोदोरे This film is online. It's really hard to find because the censor board would have banned it if I had taken it to them. But it's online if anyone wants to watch it. Uh, so in this discourse, the one thing that often gets left out when we talk about human beings on either side of this situation is the land itself, the forest, the trees. And 
that's that's an entity that I, I believe, I think a lot of us do, has its own consciousness. It's an animate entity, but no one really talks about their perspective, the perspective of the trees. So I'll read a small passage out from the novel Unga, where this teacher, Hemla, who has, uh, who's an Adivasi, but she's spent enough time in the city to understand all perspectives. And when she cycles through the jungle, she wonders about the perspective of the trees. There are places in this forest where the sunlight cannot reach, where the trees close their green fingers tight and hold their wooden arms out to shield the ground from sight. The wind doesn't venture into these, pa into these parts. The air hangs about silently, crouched like a beast of prey, ready to pounce on any strange whisper and carry it noiselessly to the ears of the guardians of this forest. The softest creak of Hemla's pedaling echoes off the treetops, skims off the surface of the stream and slithers into the dark belly of the jungle. Hemla knows it. She passes through this place often on her way to the Anganwadi where some tense, troubled Adivasi always awaits her help. Hemla pedals faster. Nothing scares her, least of all this deep, dark jungle. She too was born of the same earth these trees grew from. She is a part of them and they an extension of her. But she doesn't like delays. There is so much for her to do in so many villages. She's always short on time. If there's one thing that annoys her a little about her brothers and sisters, it is that they have no regard for time. The Adivasis move slowly, but the city folk move at express speed. And it always troubles Himla that it is this difference in speed that might become the Adivasis undoing. It's not their fault, but when the world is changing this fast, what can one do but try and keep pace with it, or fear being crushed under those giant giddy wheels? Himla doesn't like to pressure her people to change their ways, but deep down in her heart, she knows that to survive, one must adapt. Even the wild beasts do it. In Himla's book, adaptation and justice are two different things. She will not fight that creature the city folk call development. Not entirely, at least. Some things development brings could be empowering, but in bringing these things, the Adivasi's legal rights cannot be compromised. That's where Himla draws the line. But on some days, another thought haunts her. What rights do these trees have if the city folk make all the laws? And if all these laws are of humans, by humans, and for humans, what chance does a tree have? Is it fair to force a tree to make way for a road, a railway line, a building? Who fights for the trees? Which uh, again brings me back to the thing that I've been, like I said, conflicted by all my life. So why am I doing this? All the years that I spent uh, with tribals, I thought, I mean, there was a lot of rage inside, and I'm sure all of us who live this privileged life and carry this privileged guilt, this guilt of being privileged, we feel rage. But what do we do with that rage? I thought, should I be an activist? I didn't have the stamina and the courage that an activist on the field needs to go up against the system each and every day, fearing brutality, fearing arrest. I didn't have those jobs. I tried, I failed. I don't know if I can be a policy maker. I don't know if I can be a lot of things. So I decided, yes, I want to tell stories. It was very hard for me to come back to the city and choose to tell stories. So I call what I do my weapon of choice. And often when I talk to people about what to do with the rage inside, I'm like, choose your weapon of choice. Choose that one thing that you think you can do well enough to not, I won't use the words make a difference. I don't know if we can really make a difference but at least we can implant questions and send everyone out on a journey to find their own answers. So storytelling, I decided, was my weapon of choice. And I'll play you this one last clip from a feature film called Joram, which is around the same situation, which releases on the 8th of December. I finally got a chance to take a story of this sort into the mainstream on a certain scale. And I'm inviting, once the film releases, I'm inviting a whole lot of difficult conversations. I'm just bracing myself for that.
Since I have about a minute left, I'll just read two very tiny tweet-sized stories on which this film is based. I adapted it from two of my own short stories. One's called Mine. He was mine until a company cleared our village and dug a mine. He now wears khaki, I wear green. We sow bullets in our land to reap an iron harvest. And the other one is called ambush. The dam waters are deep. The troop is tense. As they cross over into Naxal territory, one of the CRPF Jawans asks their Adivasi boatman, so where's your village? Right below us, he murmurs. Thank you. So I think I'll take questions if anyone has any. Hi, Devashish. Uh, Hi. It's an honor to have you today here. And um, so I have a very simple question. Uh, it might intrigue you a little, but uh, since you uh, started with sharing uh, your thoughts on how it's so difficult to bring such narratives, such stories to mainstream, when you started with your journey initially, would you like to share any incident which you must have faced, might have faced, um, reaching out to people, showcase your work, in the mainstream media, um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would definitely like to have, um, like, like, like to know about it. Yeah, I don't know if I can recount just one incident, but you know, it's, it's I started trying to make films 20 years ago, and okay. I was inspired by Satyajit Ray, and I realized he had made 39 films, so I thought if I start 20 years ago, I'll make at least 20. It's been 20 years, I've made four of which one never released. So these stories n are really hard to find funding for because right. obviously right. funding and the resources are in the hands of those who don't care for these narratives mostly and those who'd like these narratives to not be in the mainstream. So which is, I didn't start out being a novelist or a short story writer or a children book author. My films weren't getting made. I had about 18 or 20 films get shelved over a 10 year period. I started dabbling in other mediums. Okay. So I just tried to tell these stories in as many and as widespread uh, number of mediums as possible so I could reach all kinds of people and so that I wouldn't go to my grave with this weight on my soul that I managed to just tell two or th three stories that nobody watched. So I, t I can give you n number of examples of how I, I have been called all kinds of things including a sympathizer for wanting to bring these stories into the mainstream. It gets seen through a political lens only. Yeah. Nobody sees it through an environmental, sociological, uh, anthropological lens and to make people in Bombay understand that has taken me probably a better part of my lifetime. I, can, I think I can totally understand this. Also just one more thing, uh, like how many tribes uh, you might have ended up meeting uh, till your journey this far? You know the, the, the diversity of tribes in India is mind boggling. Do you know that we have over 19,000 tribal dialects only in India? Now the difference between a language and a dialect, to quote somebody whose name I forget, is a dialect is a language with a gun to its head. Which is why the dialects and maybe some of them have two or three people speaking it today, but we have over 19,000 dialects. I met over 240 tribes in Odisha alone. Every two kilometers the dialect changes. There's that kind of diversity and system, government after government has tended to see uh, the tribals in one broad stroke and not really acknowledge the complexity in that diversity and have the complex conversations. Mm -hmm. Hence my struggle with my narratives. I don't know how to reflect that complexity when I'm trying to initiate people into this, this situation. And uh, what are, what, I'm so sorry, I'll just take one more minute. Uh, what's the difficulty level like when you communicate with these tribes and uh, when they communicate with you? To answer that question, I'll be otherizing them. It's not they, it's a human connection. So we find our ways. I eat with them, I sit with them. Okay, using the okay. word them is otherizing them. So I'm very conflicted about these conversations. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm so sorry if... Uh, no, no, that's okay. That's, these are complex conversations we should be having. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah, I, I'm, I think I uh, 
will change this whole perspective of mine with time, for sure. But thank you so much for answering thank you. these questions, Devishish. Thank you. I've attended several uh, events supposed to be organized by the Cultural Ministry. Where I'm sorry, I, I can't follow you. I've attended many cultural events which have been attended by so-called bigies of government. And they've ended up talking about property instead of painting. You know, I mean, they're only worried about what's happening to land deals. And actually, the Minister of Culture and his... And also, if he has completely changed its um, structure or ethos from all the years that I have been involved with IFI. So you're not the only filmmaker that is... You're talking about IFI? IFI, yeah. IFI. You know, so you know, I mean, I don't want to deride you, but you're not the only filmmaker that is struggling to bring out messages... If you can just take your mic a little further, I can't follow you. Messages, yeah. messages on film. A little further. A little um, further, it's reverberating. A big round of applause to... <laughs> Thank you. No, a big round of applause to GLF for having such a difficult conversation on stage. No, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm requesting Rahul to give away a uh, token of appreciation. Go there, go to the stage. So that, uh, that gift is uh, made by uh, Second Life, which Rahul is an entrepreneur.